Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's event. My name is Catherine. I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell City of Books in Portland, Oregon. Uh, before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at pals.com. If you don't already do so, please consider following us on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, tonight, we're excited to welcome Margot Wood and Gail Foreman. Margot Wood founded Epic Reads and has been working in marketing, oh, has worked in marketing for more than a decade at publishing houses, both big and small. Uh, she is a graduate of Emerson College and once appeared as an extra in the Love, Simon movie. Fresh is her debut novel, which came out this week. Uh, born and raised in Cincinnati, she now lives in Portland, Oregon. You can find her online at margowood.com. Um, some students enter their freshman year of college knowing exactly what they want to do with their lives. Elliot McHugh is not one of those people. But picking a major is the last thing on Elliot's mind, which is too busy experiencing all that college has to offer. From dancing all night at off-campus parties, to testing her RA Rose's patience, to making new friends, to having the best sex one can have on a twin-sized dorm room bed. <laughs> but she may not be ready for the fallout with reality hits. When the sex she's having isn't that great, when finals creep up and smack her right in the face, or when her roommate's boyfriend turns out to be the biggest a-hole. Elliot may make ep epic mistakes, but if she's honest with herself and with you, dear reader, she may just find the person she wants to be. Joining Wood in conversation is Gail Foreman. Foreman is an award-winning author and journalist. She has written several best-selling novels, including the number one New York Times bestseller, If I Stay, which has been translated into more than 40 languages and in 2014 was adopted, adapted into a major motion picture. Her most recent YA novel is We Are Inevitable. Gail's essays and nonfiction work has appeared in publications like the New York Times, Elle, The Nation, and Time. She lives in Brooklyn, New York with her husband and daughters. This evening's event will include an author Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. As well as someone has typed a question that you would also like to know the answer to, please upvote that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Uh, most importantly, please support Margot and Howells by, support, sorry, by, well, by purchasing a copy of her new book from us. A link to buy fresh along with a link to buy Gail's books will be shared in the chat a couple of times this evening. Margot, Gail, what a pleasure to welcome you both. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Pals. I love that we're doing this at Pals together. And congratulations, Margot. Thank you. Oh, oh my gosh. Gail, you like I've crossed over. You've crossed over to the author side of things. And I have so many questions for you, but I just want to give a content warning. Um, sexy talk. Sexy talk. I also tend to swear. So if you're um, not cool with the swearing, you know. I'm this sorry. is not the book for you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Please, please Love exit. This for you, and this is not the book for you. Go with, go with God or goddess. Go with um, God. Yeah. So I feel like I read this book in the dark days of winter, and I can't tell you how much this is a book that we need right now. It was, it is the book that if you read in public, you will laugh out loud. You might snort some like coffee or something through your nose. It is one of those. And I feel like that is something that I haven't seen a lot of these days, particularly in the YA space, is just something that's just so absolutely funny and also such a delightful coming of age story. So I have a million questions for you. First, I want you to give like your elevator pitch to people who have not read Fresh. And if you haven't, like it's been out for two days, go get it now. No, why haven't you read it yet? Come on. Come on. I, and you call yourself a reader, my God. Dead <laughs> um, <laughs> The elevator pitch is Fresh is a queer retelling of Emma said at Emerson College. That pretty much gives you an overview of everything of what happens. But what it really is about is just your freshman year and like the insanity of being away from home for the very first time and cutting loose and making mistakes and trying to recover from those mistakes, but also just like sex versus intimacy and you know um how to eat well uh <laughs> making sure you wear shower shoes in the shower like it, I tried to really encompass and capture like the entire freshman year experience from orientation week all the way to the end where you're packing up all of your crap at the end of your freshman year and have to get it back home somehow right. um so really it starts day one and it ends the last day of a freshman year 
I definitely want to talk a little bit later about how few books there are that explore this time. And because um, it's something that I also love to write about. Like, I think I have one YA book set in, anywhere in a high school and everything else is beyond. But before yes, that- Yes, which is why I, I love all of your books. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I want to start with the Emma thing because when I heard this, it's like a retelling of Emma in particular is a high bar. <laughs> like it's been done in this incredibly sort of classic way before. So I felt like yours was part in the pun so fresh because I think if you hadn't told me, if I hadn't known going in, it's, it's subtle enough that the story stands on its own. And then when you start to realize that it's a retelling and it is such a modern retelling, it, it adds to it as opposed to feeling sort of slavish to the material. But I wanna ask, the question I know we always get, but like, what made you, somebody who has been around YA for so long and, and around books so long, what made you want to tell this particular story? Well, first of all, you used fresh as a pun, so everybody has to drink. Uh, that's the new drinking game. <laughs> um, anytime anybody uses it in a review, you have to take a shot. Um, so, I wanted to tell the story. The Emma thing came in later. That didn't come in until I had about 40%, 30 to 40% of the book already written. Um, I had the characters, I had the setting, I had the themes I wanted to tell. I had like what I wanted to get across, but I didn't have a story. <laughs> um, <laughs> turns out that's kind of important to a book um, is an actual plot. <laughs> so it started though, based on this letter that I wrote to my little sister after I was a freshman in college. I was bored one day at an internship and I just started writing down everything I could remember that I had screwed up my, you know, the last year that I didn't want my little sister to make the same mistakes that I did. And it's very dated. A lot of the things in there are really 2004. So like one of them was like, don't bring a lot of CDs with you. Um, you know, stuff that are those. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, it was like, it was really funny. I love the, the technology aspect of that. It's just, oh, yeah. it's amazing. But it started out with that letter and I, and I found that letter back in 2014 and I thought it was funny <laughs> when I read it. I think when I wrote it originally, I wasn't trying to be funny. I was just like, I just wanted to remember everything so that she would know what to do when she got to college. But when I reread it so many years after graduating, I was like, okay, this is actually really hilarious. Like all of these memories flooding back to me. And so I started to just write a handful of scenes based on each one of those mistakes. Like Elliot McHugh immediately formed into my brain, her name, her personality, everything sort of formed in my brain, like right off the bat. Um, but I didn't really have anything else beyond that. And I had approached a, an agent um, and I asked him, I was like, what do you think? You know, like, could this be something? Cause it was always breaking the fourth wall. The footnotes were always there. The like comedy was always there. And he said straight up that no, no publisher would publish a book a YA book about college girls wanting to have sex. Is
got a book <laughs> and so that's what I did. I started to write more and more of it. And then I got stuck. <laughs> At one point I was just like, I, I still couldn't figure out what the story was, you know? And I didn't know what to do. And I started reading like a bunch of how to write books, like writing for dummies. I read like the Stephen King on writing, you know, none of those helped. <laughs> none of those solved the problem, which was, I didn't know how to come up with a plot. So I had to step out of my own head and put my marketing hat on and was like, if I had an author come to me and they were like, I'm trying to write this book and I've got all these great things and great characters and great style to it, but I don't know what the plot is. What would I tell that author from a professional perspective? And I said, stop trying to reinvent the wheel and go do a retelling <laughs> because there's so many of them. I've worked on hundreds of them in my career. So then I was like, okay, well, which one do I retell? And that's when I went back and look at, looked at some of the old classics that I don't like a lot of classics. I find them very boring, but I love Jane Austen. <laughs> I love Jane Austen. How she was able to write these books that are still, when you read them now, they they read, they feel contemporary. I mean, minus all the like weird British, you know, Victorian era stuff that was happening, like minus all that stuff, like the, the core issues and the dialogue and like the themes that they explore in that. Um, it, and these female characters, like it feels so, it feels very contemporary. And within 20 pages of rereading Emma, that's when I knew that it was that, that that's what I'd already been writing this whole right. time. It's like you were already been writing it. It was like, instantly Emma, Elliot, Lucy, Harriet, like the characters were already there and the themes were mirrored very similarly and Elliot and Emma were so similar and so that's what I was really looking at was like these the character the titular character of Emma because I love that she's so confident and cocky and not really deservedly so right <laughs> you know, she didn't well, earn the right to self-awareness in the beginning <laughs> exactly so I just, I love female characters that are like that though, because you see it a lot in male characters all the time, actually. Um, but you rarely see it in women and, uh, you know, especially in YA, I think. So I, the fact that Emma already, you know, Elliot already, already reminded me of Emma. It wrote itself basically after that, like literally it was so, was the second I knew what I was going to do with it, it fell into place in three months. And then three months after that, it sold. So <laughs> Um, you gave me so much in that answer that I want to follow up on. Um, a little sidebar for all budding writers out there, like public service announcement, like listen to your instinct. You yes. are going to find naysayers throughout your career. And sometimes it's a matter of timing. Maybe this book needed to percolate a couple of years. Maybe it needed a female agent to get it. Yes. But listen to your instinct. Since you did bring up, you know, that you sent, um, a, a passage to this agent and she was all on. I believe you have the particular passage. I do. Yes. Yeah, so would you like to set it up a little bit? It is chapter 16. So actually this paragraph that I'm going to read, no context. Is necessary. Is necessary. So, <laughs> okay, here we go. Chapter 16. Let me tell you about the first, the very first time someone went down on me. And there was a footnote and it's the 69th footnote. I have nothing to add here. I just wanted to call out that this is the 69th footnote. I wanted to make sure that that was where it was placed in the book. It happened in November of my junior year of high school. My boyfriend, yes, that boyfriend, the one who cheated on me, and I had been back together for about two months and we were at his house after school one afternoon. No one was home and we were making out on, on the couch in the living room. I can't quite recall what led up to the moment in question, but let's just say one minute I was fiddling with his jiggly puffs and the next he was munching on my squirtle. As it was happening, I was so stupendously nervous that I couldn't steady my breathing at all and, and all of the muscles in my hands froze. I couldn't bend my fingers at all. I'm not even exaggerating for comedic, comedic effect. I was essentially paralyzed from the elbow out to my fingers and it looked like I was about to do the robot, robot dance, but my wiring short circuited and I powered down mid dance. Eventually I had to help him to ask me to pull, I eventually had to ask him to help me pull my pants back on because my hands were stuck in the same positions as Barbie's. Anywho, I bring this flashback up because if you compare that experience to the, what is currently happening, this one is so much worse. <laughs> so, and what's currently happening is somebody's going down on her and it is very bad experience. And on the next page, she goes into detail 
of all of the things she's thinking about while he's exploring spelunking in her lady cave, as Elliot calls it. <laughs> well, I feel like that was a very perfect passage to read for so many reasons. Um, the voice, as I mentioned, the voice is the thing where you, you, I remember from page one, I get asked to read a lot of things for blurbs and I read this one and from the very first page, you understand that this is such a unique and hilarious voice. Also, I have to say, Writing sex scenes is really hard. Writing oral sex scenes is really hard. Writing humorous oral sex scenes are, is impossible. So I just, it, this book is so full of this. And I started writing YA, I think my first YA book came out in like 2007. And I feel like back in those days when you had sex in YA, first of all, it was always sort of heteronormative. And second of all, it was often like, something bad was going to happen. It was, it was an after school special of this thing is happening. And so here you have such a wonderful, fluid, Elliot sleeps with all kinds of people. Her friends are all sleeping with all kinds of people. It's this beautiful casual diversity that I think really represents where we are in many ways. But also I was really struck by the fact that this young woman is given license to experiment around sexually and in every other ways. And she makes a ton of mistakes. Mm -hmm. But there's no like dun dun dun. I mean, she faces some some tough situations as one will in college, and I and I kind of love how she gets through them. But it was just remarkable, and I just kind of want to give you credit for that, and also to tell all of you who are watching what a great read it makes. So, I guess that was just me gushing. <laughs> I appreciate also, that. <laughs> I mean, obviously, this was the book that you needed to write. But did you feel like did you feel a sort of sense of responsibility, or that this is something that you haven't seen enough of? Yeah, I really did feel like, because I knew that a lot of the choices I was going to be making in this book were go was going to put off a lot of people, you know, the fact that there's an entire chapter of a guy going down on her and it's very bad and she's talking about it in Pokemon terms. Um, so like I knew some that was going to make people uncomfortable because I think sex makes a lot of people uncomfortable and especially I, I the Pokemon would get people uncomfortable <laughs> yeah. because not everybody's into it. And I gotta say, there are a lot of Pokemon that I could have put in there. So I really held back. <laughs> Um, I'm just saying that right now. Your darlings. Yeah. Um, but no, I think, I think sex makes a lot of people uncomfortable and especially when you talk about it in a funny way, especially when women talk about it in a funny way. One of the only classes that I really, um, took outside of the marketing at, at Emerson that really stuck with me was this comedy history of comedy class. And it was all about how women have a really hard time being taken seriously as comedians because people don't like it when women are raunchy. Like that makes them very, very uncomfortable. And that has been in the back of my head ever since college. And I wanted to explore that in YA because A, I hadn't read anything like that. You know, like there's a lot of funny YA books out there and there's a lot of YA books that deal with sex, but there weren't any that were combining the two and like going into like how awkward it is, you know, like sex is awkward, especially in college. Like, I'm sorry, there are YA books where the two characters finally have sex and it is like, you know, mind blowing. And I'm like, I'm sorry, they're virgins. How are they good at this? Like, do no. they know which hole to put it in? Like, how do they know <laughs> what the sex condoms, is? Condoms alone, like- Everything, the whole like thing. This, this it's, all, it's all awkward and weird and uncomfortable. And there's a lot more communication that actually happens, you know? Um, so for me, it was, I love- romance books like I love the like beautiful sex scenes like and things like that where it's all perfect and stuff and I love that but I for it didn't ring it doesn't ring honest you know it feels like fantasy almost in a way so for me it was and we love, and we love fantasy, fantasy and I love fantasy great. I do I love it but like I didn't want to write that I wanted to write like what it's actually like trying to have sex on a twin xl in college like it's not good <laughs> but I also hadn't seen any books especially in YA go into and explore the idea of wanting to have good sex. So Elliot's not a virgin when this book starts. Like she's not, she's, she's had sex before with a variety of genders. And so for her, it's not about losing her virginity. And it's not about exploring her sexual identity. You know, she is bisexual. That's never questioned. It's not something she's exploring in this book. What she's exploring is like intimacy how to have good sex and be intimate and also be a good partner and that was sort of the thing that I was missing in YA books especially ones that deal with sex too is just the like those discussions of like 
it's okay to ask for good sex or to be like, I'm not compatible with you sexually, so I'm going to leave. And what Elliot doesn't do well is that she's not very respectful of when she she just ghosts people, you know. Um, she so goes that's a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people. Yeah. It, don't worry, it comes around to bite her in the ass later. But um, you know, I that's what I was really missing from why it was just like a really frank and honest conversation about like all right, you've had, you've lost your virginity, now what? <laughs> so I love all this. I love Elliot. She is a delightful, hot mess, um, in hot in all the different ways. Coming from marketing, particularly yeah. in YA, I'm sure you have seen that having a YA character who is flawed and, and not always incredibly likable it's probably, it is, it is a difficult thing, I think, for writers writing for any age, but I think with why in particular, there can be a, well, I wouldn't even say that because adult readers are just the same. Like there can be a harsh judgment mm -hmm. on a flawed young person like Elia. And so knowing that and knowing how readers really often want these sort of aspirational, perfect, putting strong in air quotes, young women in particular, like, how did that impact how you approached Elliot? It's really, it's a fine line to have somebody who screws up and isn't always a nice person to other people, you know? Um, it's hard to make an audience root for that person, but I think you can do it if that character means well. Like, and that's what I really wanted to try to get with Elliot. Like, yeah, she screws up, she makes mistakes, but she, her baseline is that she does genuinely mean well. And so in order for readers to not just immediately kick her to the curb the second she makes a mistake is self-deprecation. Like if you can make fun of yourself, then a lot of people find it's okay to like laugh with you at you. You know what I mean? So that's like a comedy trick a lot of the time is that like a lot of comedians will immediately start making fun of themselves because it gives the audience license to laugh at it and it also allows them to point out that they are flawed themselves so like if a character is self-aware enough that they are flawed then it kind of it helps readers get over that threshold I think um mm -hmm. at least from the books that I was reading and sort of studying some of my favorite sort of flawed endearing characters is that they like Emma, you know, she means well, like she's just trying to get her friends laid. <laughs> That's what she's doing. Um, she, is she good at it? No. Should she not be involved in everybody's life? Definitely not. But that's, but at her core, she's just trying to get people laid and that's a good thing. You know, <laughs> we support that. <laughs> we do support that, but you're right. Like there's this funny thing in YA where readers love to say, that they like, that they want more messy characters, like lead characters, or that they want characters that, you know, aren't very likable. And then you, there are a lot of books out there that have that. And then a lot of people immediately write those characters off and they're like, oh, I just couldn't relate, you know? Um, so I do but think- could. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Exactly, exactly. And I think, you know, I find the characters that are too good are just boring to me you know mm -hmm. um I like people who screw up like isn't that kind of the whole point <laughs> of life is to screw up and learn from your mistakes absolutely absolutely and, <laughs> and I think I think comedy helps honestly I think if I was writing a serious book with a flawed character I think it's a lot harder but like since it's a comedy and it's Elliot who's screwing up you know all this stuff and it does come back to biter so it, it the it comedy helps to biter. I do think that Part of the technique of having Elliot break the fourth wall and talk to you, dear reader, you know, mm -hmm. as Emma would, it also draws you in as her intimate. So yes. she's like that friend you have that you're like rolling your eyes at, also a little bit jealous of because she's having so much fun. So it was so effective. And I was, as I was reading it, it did not feel anything like a debut. It, it was so <laughs> accomplished and smooth. And I'm like, this is obviously somebody who is, who is, even though you don't call yourself a writer, you obviously are. And I imagine you internalized a lot of lessons from all your years of working in the industry. So I'm gonna segue from that to like, what is it like going from sort of the marketing side and the sort of that side to, to being in the author seat? It's, I have a newfound appreciation for 
both sides now. I have a newfound appreciation for what marketing and design teams and publicity teams and editorial, like I have a newfound appreciation for what they go through because I can, I've now seen the whole process from start to finish because before I'd only ever seen it when the book was done and it was on the sales and marketing side. So now I got, I'd never been part of like the submission process or anything like that. So I didn't really know what any of that was like. So for me, being able to see it from a 360 perspective from literally both sides, I have an appreciation for what publishers do. And I also have an appreciation for authors. It's made me hypersensitive to the anxieties that authors go through because I didn't know about all the waiting. (laughs) There's so much waiting, like just sitting there and nothing's happening. And when nothing's happening, people tend to like have all these, you know, they build things up in their heads, especially when it comes to the marketing side. Like if an author doesn't hear from their marketing team, they just assume that nothing is being done. And that had, I had been with authors so often from the other side, and I just didn't understand why they couldn't trust that things were happening. But now I get it because you go through months of not hearing from anybody and then everything all at once and then it all dies again you know so like I'm in the middle of my release week right now which is great I'm getting lots of love tons of notifications I feel so special but in like next week I'm yesterday's news (laughs) you know what I mean and the marketing machine moves on to the next week's titles yes and and that's where word of mouth takes over and I feel like exactly I I should get drinking plan privileges I feel like yours is going to have a longer shelf life oh god willing Fresh. TikTok, Fresh. TikTok, come on. <laughs> I know TikTok, you know, we know that TikTok loves books that make you cry. Yes, you they know. do. What sorry, about- TikTok. This one is not going to make you cry. I'm so sorry. Laughing and also lots of sexy parts. And yes. like fun sexy parts. Yeah. Yes. So I will say from, I... I approached, you know, it's funny. There was a lot of pressure on me from people, friends in the industry. In fact, I'm fairly certain. Yep, Maggie. Hi, Maggie. I see you in the participants section. (laughs) There's a lot of pressure people I used to work with who are now at different houses and stuff. And they're all like, oh, do you think you're going to hit the list? Do you think you're going to hit the list? Or like, you're going to have this amazing marketing plan and all this stuff. And I was like, I, you got to (laughs) like... Yeah, I'm not going to hit the list. Let's be honest. Like this list is impossible to hit. It is bonkers right now. It is bonkers. It is so competitive. And I'm hyper aware of the fact that I'm just one of many, you know? Um, So I think there was a lot of pressure that people, especially other authors, were going to think that I was going to do things differently. And the thing is, is that the one true thing about publishing and marketing is that it's almost never in your control unless you have a ton of marketing dollars. And I'm talking like 100K plus marketing dollars, which almost no titles get. So it's really out of your control. You can only just do your best to get it out there and hope that it finds the right people. And that's exactly what's happening with Fresh too. Like even though I know the ins and outs of the publishing industry and what sales conferences and metadata and the Onyx feed and all of that stuff and like how the warehouses work, like regardless of all of that, having that knowledge, all it does is just make me aware that these things aren't going to actually, they don't, it, it's up to readers. It really is. It all comes down to the read and the readers. Like marketing can move the needle Um, Like I said, especially if they have a lot of like money to put behind it and like it's marketing's job to just provide all the assets and provide the information and the content. So it's there if anybody wants to go looking for it, but it's up to the readers in order to, you know, it's like you said earlier, word of mouth. In fact, you are the only author I have ever worked with. This, This shows how much of a pro you are. You're the only one who's ever mentioned word of mouth ever in my career. I feel like what all of that marketing and all of the buzz can do is break through. And this is harder than ever now because there is so much content that is competing for our ever short attention spans. That's exactly right. I think a lot of people forget. it It is really getting to the point where enough people are reading it, then it's like, then the word of mouth. It's like, oh my God, I read this hilarious book. And then you see something on TikTok and then you see it in the store and it's like the three or five touches and absolutely. And so that's really the thing is getting this. And I think this book that you've written because there's so much to say about it. I expect 
this will this will be like a pass from friend to friend to friend a word of mouth thing oh thank you i hope so and you you actually you hit it on the nail on the head because i think a lot of people tend to think that if their book didn't sell well it's like a failure of some sort of on the marketing or the sales department and i actually just think that it's i mean think about it, the fact that we rarely have tv shows or movies that everyone is watching like when we grew up it was like friends seinfeld's like Frasier, like everybody yes. and their yeah. mother was watching that thing because there wasn't the there wasn't quantity. Yeah. Exactly. There weren't as many options, but now we're in this era of like micro niche audiences and, and it's a good thing, but it also means it's a lot harder to break out. So what's important with the marketing for anybody who's watching is curious about marketing. It's about finding those micro audiences and really making sure that they're the ones that have your book. And so for me, it was like queer readers and ADHD readers, and also Emerson College. I My Emerson alumni forums are great. Emerson. I want to talk about Emerson. But before we do, again, PSA to any writers out there, like the only part of the process that you control is the book that you are working on right now. It is about that. And, and it's very good, and we'll ask about this if you're working on anything else, because I always find it's great to already be working on that one thing you can control when you have a book coming out, because that part of it is so out of your control that it allows you to fixate on the thing that is in your control. So anything going on there, Marga? Um, Not yet. <laughs> okay, get on it. I I'm, I was waiting until Fresh came out, to be honest, because I still have a day job. I'm still director of sales and marketing at Oni Press in Portland, Oregon. So I work in comics, um, uh, you know, full time until very recently. And now I switched to 30 hours, like oh, <laughs> big whoop. I dropped one whole day. Um, but yeah, so I've been kind of waiting because my, my brain only had room for like my day job plus one other thing. And it was either going to be write or promote Fresh and I no, have. and you've been amazing at promoting. I don't know if everybody's oh, been watching Margo's TikToks and Instagram. It, they're so entertaining. It is fabulous. <laughs> um, so what was the response from Emerson? Because, you know, I don't know if we mentioned that Margo is an Emerson alum, and this takes place at Emerson, and I was looking at some of the Goodreads before, and there was some Emerson. Yes. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so spot on. <gasps> the Emerson kids are showing up, and I am so thrilled with that um i'm actually a second generation my grandmother went to emerson in the 40s she didn't she never graduated um but um so emerson is like in my blood um and the emerson community is a very tight-knit community in fact they're called we call ourselves the mafia it's the emerson mafia um because like in hollywood especially in entertainment fields, there's such a strong connection that like a lot of times you get jobs or work solely just because you went to Emerson, which is true. And like, and the few times that I've been able to like hire interns and stuff, and I'm just like, I always offer to Emerson students first before I open it up to anybody else. I'm like, anybody, any takers, you know? Um, so it's a really, really tight knit community. And the people who go to Emerson, they're a unique <laughs> crowd. Uh, usually people that go to Emerson also end up applying to USC and NYU, but USC and NYU also attract a wider crowd of students. But Emerson is very concentrated because it only, at least when I was there, it only had like eight majors and they were all communication or like film studio theater type majors. There was no art major. So it's not like mixed media stuff it's all film theater and then on and then on the marketing side so that's a communication side so people who go to emerson are like a, a different breed of their own and they have been so unbelievably supportive every time i post about it this one time i've been talking about fresh on facebook because i'm barely on facebook anymore but i've been going into the alumni facebook group for for uh emerson and i'll post about it and it'll just be like a flood of comments and people talking about the little building like where it takes place and all the stories that happen there so i so i'm if glad you, if you're an emerson alum it's full of easter eggs it's it is and i've i also when i was writing it i was um connecting with a uh, current emerson student so like a freshman this girl i was like constantly sending her dms i was like is the cafeteria still like this is the library still is it still non-existent like <laughs> i wanted to make sure because emerson got uh, renovated while i was writing it so from the beginning to the end of now it got completely redone the little building so i was like oh shit <laughs> Very inconsiderate of it while you're midway through a novel. I know. And in fact, there was some aspects of the new development of Emerson, like the laundry room. So laundry room plays a big part in the in the book. A lot of 
sexy things happen in the laundry room. (laughs) And I, but because when I was there, the laundry rooms were really, really small. So everybody hooked up in the laundry room. I don't know why, but it was just so small that it became a place to hook up. But now the new laundry rooms are very big and open. And so I just ignored that fact and just kept it how it was when I was there. <laughs> Cause I was like, otherwise I, it's not hot anymore. So <laughs> not it. yeah, I know. I mean, you can take your, um, your poetic license there. Yeah. It's fantasy. Uh, <laughs> I am going to, I, we have some questions in the Q and A, one of which you kind of already asked. Maggie asked, um, what's your perspective on book designers and marketing now mm. that you're both sides? I wonder if you want to speak a little bit about the design because yeah. this is such a specific design. And I feel like you had, if not, you 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 knew what you wanted to ask for there. But I had the Q&A. I had yeah, so most authors don't get to be involved. And I bet you are involved because you are you've been in this business for a long time. Um, but most debut authors like don't really get a say in their covers or I've had some friends who their, their cover just showed up in their inbox and they didn't even get to choose between two options. Um, and they hate their covers, you know, but then they have to publicly be like, I love it. Um, so luckily Abrams was clued me in from the very beginning. I had a vision. I have a whole Pinterest board, (laughs) um, that was very different from what they came back with me. So I told them, you know, I was like, here's my board and all this stuff. And they came back and they were like, we ignored everything on your board. (laughs) And here's, uh, here's what we've given you. And it's not this, it's not this final product. It was, um, it was more like the, a scene of Elliot's bedroom floor with like a bunch of stuff around on the floor. And it was different and it had a perspective, but it didn't feel right to me so we there was like a lot of back and forth and then we eventually decided to just go like forget trying to like depict a scene and let's just go typographic because I love I'm such a sucker for typography um and then because I also felt like if it was just so simple where it's just type on a plain background it would really stand out from the current offerings of YA that are on the shelf because what you're seeing now is a lot of, especially in contemporary rom-com is it's a lot of like illustrations. Yours are like very, very small. Yours is, I would say this is more of a typographic book than like an illustrated cover. Um, And so it is, you get that sort of like comic book style illustration that's on Mm -hmm. the cover these days. And I was like, I love that style, but I wanted fresh to stand out, whether or not people even like the cover. The goal of it was to, when you line them all up, your eye immediately goes to fresh. And by having the type be um, vertical instead of horizontal was like the perfect way to break everything up because immediately your brain has to like be like, <laughs> like reinterpret it. And I also specifically requested that there be no jacket. <laughs> because I hate jackets. I take mine off of every book. I have a whole stack of them underneath my bookshelf because I always rip off the, the jackets when I read. And I just really don't like that. So I, I was like, please, no jacket. And they said, yes. Um, I also asked for like, I really wanted it to be so that when you like did this, there would be like a funny word or a phrase or like a, a picture of like a penis or something, like just something stupid. Um, <laughs> But they were like, yeah, we can't do that. And I was like, okay, fair. <laughs> I'll settle for the no jacket. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it with the with the vertical writing. And also so often these days, particularly during the pandemic when bookstores were, were not open, even if you were ordering from an indie, and I hope you're all supporting your indies because we need them Powell's. so much. They're amazing. And Powell's is the king queen of the indies, um, the thumbnail of it. Like this is something that just pops when it's like that big. So that's, yes. these are considerations that you think about when you're thinking about it from a business perspective. So that was something when I was working at Harper Collins, we would sometimes get, you know, the full slate of upcoming titles. And there would be this book that would be, usually it always happened with a white background, a white background book with like very thin typography for the title. And it looks beautiful in person or on a designer's giant monitor. But I worked in the digital department. So I saw everything in like 300, you know, pixels wide, everything was super small. And we would get these covers where they would just dissolve into the background and you couldn't see them. So it's really important to be able to read the title of the book when it's teeny tiny. (laughs) Yeah, and it's super tiny. So yeah. 
I am going to ask one question that I want to make sure we don't miss because it's dear to my heart. And then I promise we have, we have a couple of really good questions here. I want to know um, why set it during college. And, and I will say, I and why are there so few books that are set either, if not in college, just right after high school, which to me defines young adulthood. This is really when you are practicing adulting badly for the first time, which we all go through. And it also makes for such delightful, delightful fiction because you really are on the cusp of adulthood here and you're screwing it up so many yeah. as we all do. Yeah, I, I was a late bloomer, you know, I came of age in college. So, I mean, I partied a little bit in high school, but it was all very like naive and silly. Like I screwed up a lot in college, but I would say that I learned the most because of that. You know, I learned more about who I am as a person and, you know, what I need to do in order to like thrive. I learned all that my freshman year. I didn't learn any of that in high school. I thought I did. And then I got to college and then I was like, oh, everything I thought I knew about myself is wrong. Um, so I think a lot of people just don't come of age until later, but there's this thing in book publishing where I don't know who decided <laughs> that the rule was 12 to 18 is all that YA is. And the second you graduate high school, you are an adult. And I think that's so hilarious to me because when you graduate high school and you enter your freshman year, you're the exact same age, unless your birthday is over the summer months. You are the same age. You are the same person. I mean, unless something amazing and remarkable happened to you that summer in between, you're relatively the same person. So like, why does YA stop right yeah. there? You know, why are you suddenly an adult when you're in college? I don't understand that because you're still in school. You're the same person, but you're away from home probably for the first time with access to lots of people to do lots of things with, not to mention like a Sunday bar at every meal. How are you going to handle yourself? Handle yourself there? Like there's so much, I don't know. I'm so glad you do it. I find it delightful. I hope that why figures out a way to market because I think that's part of it. I think, um, yeah, there, there, I think the issue is with publishing is that we've made these broad categories now with young adults. And I think we either need more micro categories or we just start putting ages on there. Like, I know, like they say that fresh is like 14 plus, um, because they don't, you know, I, I, I agree. I don't think 12 year olds should be reading fresh, but it is a YA book and a lot of 12 year olds read YA books. So there is like a whole gray area. We could make a whole conversation about that, but. We could, and I would have a conversation and I, and I can attest to this as a parent that kids know how to read, they know how to put aside books that they're not ready for. And also oftentimes if a 12 year old reads fresh, they're likely not going to get a lot of it. it it's going to fly over their heads. Except they're, for maybe the Pokemon references. The Pokemon references, it's so nice that you made it multi-generational that way. I'm gonna combine a couple of questions here because I think they are, they are related. Um, oh. One question is like, how difficult is it to write a book and work a full-time job at the same time? And, and, and an sort of answer to that is like being ADHD, how, how do you approach like writings and the deadline process? It was, it was really hard. Um, I tried to be one of those people because everybody's like, write every day, word counts, blah, blah, blah. And I tried to do that. And I realized very quickly that that was never going to work for me because my brain doesn't work that way. My brain works in hyper focus mode, or I'm not focusing on anything at all. And so the way that I wrote this book, and it also happened to work with having a day job, was that I pretty much wrote it in about like the thing that w went on submission was about a four month period, three to four month period of intense writing in all of my free time. So it was like sprint rest, sprint rest, but for three months, every waking moment, like I, I shifted my work hours because I also figured out what time of day I'm at my most creative, because I think that's really important. I'd read somewhere on some blog that was like, if you can figure out what time of day you're most creative, that's when you should be writing and you'll write a lot faster. So I tried in the morning. I wasn't a morning person. I tried in the evening. Definitely not. The second the sun goes down, I'm asleep. So for me, it's the afternoon. So I shifted all of my work hours and I would work like six to two. And then I'd come back home and then I would start writing from two until 6 p.m. And I would just start hyper-focusing. Well, 
eventually I'd get to the hyperfocus. I, if I could control that, <laughs> then I wouldn't be ADHD. But I do have the ability to get into a hyperfocus mode. And if anybody who's ADHD knows, if you can get into that spot, I could. I've done twelve to fourteen hour days of writing, no breaks. No, I've forgotten to drink. I've forgotten to eat. I've forgotten. I've like disassociated out of my body and didn't know where I was. And I got so much done. And that's how most of Fresh was written was in these like hyper-focused modes where I would just sit down and do, I could do 15,000 words in one day just because like I'm in that special place that only ADHD people get. So like, I think if you can try to make all the elements right for you, like knowing what time of day you were your most creative and also getting rid of distractions. I built my office into a closet. I converted a closet into my office because it has walls on either side of me, which means no access to windows or the hallway or anything else. Because if I, if I'm near a win, I would love to have a desk by a window, but if I'm by a window, I'm looking out of it. And I'm uh, the second something moves my eyes tracking it. Like I have my computer in front of the window right now. And I see my neighbor's cat and I'm like thinking about that cat. <laughs> so and knowing yourself and knowing how you work. And then when you're having one of those days where the words are flowing, make as much, like make as most as you can out of that day. Like don't let those days go to waste. Um, is pretty much it. And honestly, deadlines help. ADHD people are really good at not doing something until the very last minute, but then we can like power through and do it all and get it done. So I kind of made up deadlines for myself and they weren't like, oh, I have to have it done by this date. It was more like, if you don't finish this book, you will be irrelevant because it's been a few years since you left Epic Reads and no one will know who you are and it will all be over and no one will care. <laughs> so I was like creating all of this like existential dread. And honestly, like, I don't know if that's the best method. We'll see, but- You were your it, own carrot and your own stick. So- It helped, it helped because- I, I, it, think, I think it's absolutely true. And I think you brought up so many important things, which is like, lean into the way that you write, learn, perceive the world. Yes. So, you know, as you said, you can get into that hyper-focused state. And I think we were just having a conversation with a bunch of writers over the weekend about like the different times that all of us were at our most productive. Four writers, four different times. So what works for some person won't work for you. And what time is your time? It's, it's shifted a little bit because I've trained myself to get up with my kids. So usually like as soon as they leave, I would say between like, nine and usually by one or two o'clock because that's when they're close to or at least be, it used to be when they were close to coming home now they're home all the time or they have been but I would say between like eight and two really that sweet spot is sweet spot is like 10 and 12 where I'm really going um and I will also add that the least productive people I know are like full-time writers without a lot of other things that they have to do because having there's this sort of writing that you do mentally where you're kind of thinking of stuff or it, it, you're storing it all up and having a limited period of time to just sit down and go can be incredibly helpful. Yeah. And also yeah. I think it's important to know when to stop because I used to like force myself to work an eight hour day. And it's like, I my productivity is over. It's over yeah. after I've done a certain amount, I can feel my brain start to be tired. I take the afternoon off, I exercise and then I come back and do like emails and marketing and stuff and diff the other part of our job. So yeah, I would save all that like marketing stuff and the emails and the social media. I pretty much saved that all for like the weekends or evenings. <laughs> and now that I'm on the West coast, you'll see all, most of my tweets happen like late at night now <laughs> for all the East coasters. It's because I save it all for like the end of the day when my creativity is off and I can just like bleh, and be yeah. like, you know, melt into social media. Um, yeah. yeah. So that that's helpful. And yeah, you're right. Like if I have time to plan and prepare and get ahead, I won't do it. I will wait until the last possible second <laughs> or I have no time to do it. And that's when I'll do it. So it's helpful to have a day job to sort of like keep me regimented. I wish it was less hours, to be honest. 30 is it's a lot. I, it's I will probably full -time. reduce it's full -time it. time in France. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we have a question here. And I, with this book, I would wonder, was there a scene or character that you wanted to include, but that was taken out during the editing process? Did you have to sort of kill anybody? Did I kill? I didn't kill anybody, but there was the, her older sister, Izzy, was a much larger character in the story. Um, 
In fact, the first chapter when Elliot's dad is dropping her off at Emerson, that was actually in the very beginning, it was her older sister because her older sister um, was going to school down in New York. So they just drove from Ohio to Boston and then was just going to dump her on the side of Emerson's curb and be like, see ya. And that was how Elliot was going to start her very first day because that's actually how I started (laughs) Emerson. My older sister went to Tufts in Boston. We drove from Cincinnati. She literally dumped me on the side of the curb and sped off and was like, good luck. See ya. So I was like on my own (laughs) the first day. Um, and my editor, and she also had a much bigger role, like later on during Elliot's like spiral and all this stuff. And, um, my editor was like, it can't all be her sister. We needed to have a parent in there. Cause it was, there were no parents in the story. I actually didn't have a dad character at all in there. Really? Um, yeah. Cause my dad-, dad had just died and I didn't want to like, I was like afraid of putting him in there because it would make me like you know, feel sad and grief and all that stuff. And I didn't want to associate this book with those things, but she made a really good point of being like, Elliot has parents. If she has parents, they're going to be involved with this. You know, Um, not everybody had my experience, like stop making this book all about like your own experience. So that was a really good note. So all of, um, all of those like dad scenes were originally her older sister. So the older sister was like more of a main character and then got downgraded. Um, but, But other than that, every character that I originally created is, is in the book. (laughs) Um, You know, it's interesting because I think when you and I started communicating about this book, I I was just like, how did you write such a, you know, zesty, fun, effervescent book? Like, were you just in the space and you mentioned that you're, you're, you just lost your dad. And so Mm -hmm. I think that there's, did you find sort of relief in, in the humor and lightness of all of this? My dad was a very funny person. Um, We would often compete to see who was funniest at like the dinner table. We would have these bets. We would go before like Thanksgiving and stuff and whoever could make somebody, every time I made somebody laugh, he had to give me a dollar. Anytime he made somebody laugh, I had to give him a dollar. We would see who ended up with the most dollars at the end of the night. And I would almost always win. Um, and, but he really loved that, you know, he loved, that was like our, a thing that we shared and we would share jokes back and forth with each other. And so when he passed away, I grew up with comedy being my default. Like if I'm nervous or I'm anxious, I'm going to try to make people laugh because it relaxes people. It relaxes me, you know, it breaks the tension. And so when he died, you know, like at his funeral, the first thing I do is I get up there and I was cracking jokes because I know that's what he would have done. You know, that's what, that's what he would have enjoyed. He didn't, he wasn't particularly interested in seriousness. He wasn't a serious guy. So when he, when I was going through the process of dealing with his death, fresh was the only escape I had. It was the only thing I had because nothing else was working. I, I, I lost my love of reading. I couldn't, I couldn't hold attention for any book. I TVs and movies. I just was watching old stuff on repeat because I had no interest in watching anything new. So for me, fresh was the only time that I could escape the grief was writing fresh, which is why I didn't want to put the dad in there. Cause I was like, no, this is my escape. But I, I agree with my editor and made it a much better book. <laughs> putting the dad in there. Um, so yeah, for me, it was being able to have over the last five years, moments of levity and laughter in my life. And it's through this book and knowing that it's now going to be out there. Um, and it is out there. That's like kind of what was, that was getting me through it. That was getting me through those hard times because it was, it was my form of catharsis, you know, Um, so yeah, I would be like on the days where I was having a a tough day with the grief, I wouldn't write, but some days I would wake up and channel my dad and put, put, you know, start writing fresh. So I love this idea that you would get a dollar every time. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We, everything. And and so my hope for you with this book is you make so many people laugh (laughs) and the dollars are just going to rain down from the heavens for you. God, at least, at least just enough. (laughs) I'm realistic, you know, just enough so I can quit the day job. Like (laughs) everyone, but I like this. I feel like you already have a precedent for a dollar per laugh. And I think you multiply the amount of laughter that this book is going to bring as well as thought. I mean, it's funny and it's funny because it's so real. 
and Thank it's you. cringy and you're really on the journey with her. So if there's any last minute questions, I think we are approaching the six o'clock hour for you West Coasters. And I just want to congratulate you again because this book is just a delight. And it Thank is- Thank you it so is, much. Again, it is so fresh, <laughs> so- I'm just drinking yes. water now, but just so you know, I will be having a gin and tonic as soon as we log off. <laughs> oh, I've got like four white claws waiting for me. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much buy this book from Powell's if you um, the link is in there you can buy we are inevitable which is about indie bookstores in the northwest from Powell's to that would yes be so on brand this is one of the best representations of the Pacific Northwest I have ever read so get it. we are inevitable it's so good it's so good I it's the books we, indie books Margo and I blur each other we, we did at the same time and you can go with that where you want to and I think we have Catherine back on thank you Powell's thank you Gail thank you thank Margo. you everybody who's watching I can't wait to hang out in person yes and, soon and, yes at Powell no less <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thank you, Margo and Gail. Uh, it was so wonderful to have you tonight. It was very lively, very fun. Um, I would like to thank everyone who has tuned in, um, especially on a, what day is it? Since the pandemic, I'm like, what day is it? It's uh, a Thursday. Yeah. Th is it Thursday? It's a Thursday. Oh, okay. It's like, it's like, I am back. <laughs> I'm think. like, is it Thursday? So, yeah, so thanks for everyone for tuning in on Thursday. Um, you can totally buy this book here. Look at it. I know we're not supposed to judge books by their covers, but it is beautiful, so you should. Um, but you could totally buy Margot's book here, Fresh and Pals. Do you have signed um, copies of Pals? Are you signing of Pals, or can people? I think I'm supposed to be coming into the warehouse or something at some point. Pals. Yeah. Yeah, please do. Um, you can also buy We Are Inevitable, which also is located in Pals. They're like, look at them, they're bonding. Oh, Please. I saw what I saw. We are inevitables all over the place at Powell's on all the end caps. I was so excited to see that. <laughs> You're right, right. about booksellers, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That's the work. That's the key. That's the key. All right. Um, I put links in the chat for Fresh and Gail's book. And just make sure you can visit us online. Um stop in the store for friendly people and we look forward to having you at all and they have the air soon. conditioning and yeah, they air conditioning. Yeah, they have air conditioning get the fresh of the air conditioning drink margo oh and God. buy a copy of fresh and you will it is the perfect summer read so i was like next week is supposed to be 100 again so come <laughs> on and buy a book do your thing <laughs> thank you all, all so right. much have Thanks a good everyone. one have a good night